In the case of nuclear or radiological fallout, people living around potential targets such as military bases and chemical plants may be advised to evacuate. Hello, Sublation Magazine readers, Sublation Media viewers, Sublation Podcast or Diet Soap Podcast listeners, um, and, and all the rest of you who happen to stumble upon this live stream. Uh, this is a Sublation Magazine show. I'm Douglas Lane, and Ashley Frawley is muted. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I was like, I did it this time, I didn't screw anything up. <laughs> I muted myself. I muted myself so I could open a beer with, <laughs> without it making this sound. Ah, I was so close. Every week, it's a tradition, you know. I have to <laughs> screw up the opening in some way. Let's just do uh, that over again. It's well, not yeah, like so it's we stop live the stream anything. and start over. Um, so uh, we have a big announcement this week. Um. You know, we have the Sublation Magazine. It's an online magazine. Um, it was founded last year. Spencer Leonard was the uh, editor-in-chief. Um, he has uh, moved on. Um, for a little while, I was the absentee interim editor, meaning I put my name on the masthead and did a couple of things, but really, I, I let it flounder. And now we are going to relaunch the magazine. Um, we have Alfie Bound on the stream with us. I'm going to bring him in right now. And um, Alfie was the uh, culture editor um, or just the commissioning editor at uh, at Sublation Magazine from the start, meaning you did a lot of work really in the early days of launching the magazine along with Jean and, uh, Bajlan and, um, and Spencer. And now you are going to be the editor of Sublation Magazine. I will stick around as a commissioning editor. Ashley's been brought on board as commissioning editor. Um, and uh, there are a few other people as well. But but Alfie, um, welcome to the Sublation Magazine show. It's not your first time here. What are you planning to do as the new editor of Sublation Magazine? Great. Hi, guys. Good. Thanks for having me on. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, what, are, what, are, what am I planning to do? I don't know. <laughs> um, working, I mean, lots of things, loads of things. I think that, you know, my, my view on this is that, um, you know, we did uh, start very well. And I want to say, uh, you know, I'm really proud to have um, worked with Gene and Spencer as well on, on what we did. And I'm really proud of what the magazine like has done so far. We've published some amazing people. I'm sure like some, some of our listeners know, but you know, everyone from uh, Slavoj Žižek to Jody Dean to Ted Reese, who's been a fantastic contributor recently. We, we published dozens. I couldn't start naming them really, but we've published. And Ashley Frawley. I mean, I, I also and... bestowed. <laughs> yeah, you published <laughs> someone named Douglas Lane from time to time. Yeah, we did do those things. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think we've done I think we've done great. And I think that, you know, we had a, a number of different voices and that we still we still should. I think what and why I suggested this kind of. Um, you know, this title, this kind of topic for, for today's show is I think, you know, I was I've been thinking a bit about what, um, you know, what Sublation magazine is. Um, and, you know, obviously we started with this kind of like critiquing the left from the left thing. And I think we, you know, the three of us at least kind of retain some interest in that kind of um, theme. Um, and then but, you know, we have a variety of contributors. You know, we have people who are um, more interested in um, you know, working within things like the DSA and, and we have others who are more interested in, you know, throwing out that entirely and, and, and looking for something else. Uh, and I but I think what unites the kind of different people that are, are involved in the magazine is this kind of critique of liberalism, really, or this this kind of strong feeling that, you know, we're not just up against the fascists, as many of the liberals would have you believe, but we're up against uh, particular kinds of liberalism and particular kinds of capitalism, which kind of embody uh, the, the moment today. And I think what makes us unique is that this this is the kind of unifying you know, thrust of our approach, like what what are the different kinds of enemies we're up against? And it's not just uh, the ones that the mainstream media and, and other magazines uh, would have you think. Um, so I, I think I, I really want to like work uh, in this way in a variety of approaches to kind of different critiques of liberalism and capitalism. And, and this is going to be a, a strength of our Marxist strand and so on uh, as well. And then, you know, I'm also, as you guys know, really interested in, in critical theory, philosophy and psychoanalysis. So I also want to have 
uh, a strand like that, uh, as we've we've been doing, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I guess my my feeling was to bring in also a, a group of people, like obviously you you guys who have been part of it. Um, myself, uh, and then some some newer people who have been in and around the team and writing with us to sort of bring in slightly different approaches. One thing I really want to do is like have kind of strong columnists, which we've kind of naturally developed. We've got one there in the chat just arrived, Stefan, uh, who's probably one of our strongest columnists. I don't know, he's published five or even six now great essays. And Jason Miles is also going to join us as a columnist and Helen Rollins, um, who, who, who will be with us in a little while as well. Um, so I think, uh, and I just mentioned Ted Reese. So I think, you know, we want to carry on doing what we're doing. We want to publish much more regularly. We want to have this unifying theme of different critiques of capitalism, liberalism, uh, and the, the contemporary moment that we're, we're the, the pile of shit that we're living in. Uh, and, uh, we want to carry on doing what we're doing, but I also want to like bring on, yeah, board regular voices and, uh, articles people can keep coming back to. And we've published, uh, five things today to kind of get us started so i guess we'll have a chance to talk about some of those but i, I think it's uh, really exciting we've made a great start and we need to sort of you know jump forward to the next step with it and hopefully you guys are going to keep doing this fantastic magazine show as well uh and we can take it to the next stage really i hope yeah that's great i um i want to ask and maybe uh, ashley you're about to say like how are we thinking about the term liberalism yeah, so I, I just I tweeted um, earlier just a kind of um, well I, I retweeted our our, uh, our Twitter feed um, about how liberal often gets thrown around as an insult. So on the right, liberal is an insult for like lefties who are maybe a bit soft or something like that. Or uh, and then on the left, we use the word liberal as an insult. And I always remember just seeing this exchange between. Lee Phillips, friend of the uh, friend of Sublation Media, um, also just generally, I think just someone who's really thinking along really progressive lines. He's thinking about the questions that we need to be thinking about today around uh, what comes next and what aspects of culture are progressive and, and society and technology are progressive and so on. Anyway, somebody called him a liberal. Oh, that <laughs> sounds like, <laughs> and he says, "Thank you. I am avowedly." Uh, a liberal, I, see, I seek for the uh, sublation of liberalism, um, to give the world what liberalism could not but fail to give. And he said Marx was that too. And I think a lot of people get really angry about that, the idea Marx was a liberal. Well, yes, I mean, the young Marx certainly was an avowed liberal and a Democrat. And um, he began to uh, become very disillusioned with that when he realized very early on um, that capitalist society could not deliver the goods. Um, and so we want, it's not that you sort of negate everything that liberalism promised. So, you know, you often see people have this very blase attitude toward free speech, like, oh, that's a liberal idea, or that's like a capitalist idea that because it was something, you know, a lot of our sort of liberal ideals of citizenship were birthed with capitalism during the Enlightenment era. And you think, well, these things, they just became, um, apologies for capitalism. And that's absolutely true. But that doesn't mean that you just let them go. In fact, the critique of liberalism is the fact that when push comes to shove, when it comes down to a choice between economic liberalism, economic freedoms, and your political freedoms, liberals will collapse all of the all of the political freedoms and go for economic freedom. So if we give up on liberal ideals, we take a shortcut to where they, those people end up anyway. Um, in sort of having a blase attitude toward freedom, like none of it really matters. Um, so I think liberalism has a kind of contested meaning, obviously, is a lot of contested meanings and a lot of contested history and a lot of um, contestation in terms of its future. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. And I think there's, I mean, there's two answers to that, really. I mean, I mean, Lee's a great writer as well. I definitely, uh, definitely like his stuff a lot. But I think there's two answers to that, really. One is that, like, um, the, the what's at stake in all these terms is obviously something we want to engage with. You know, we've had articles dealing with the term fascism and how that's thrown around. And we need to think about the way the term liberalism is thrown around and so on. And what, you know, so engaging with these questions of what these terms actually are and what role they play. And, you know, again, I can see questions in the chat. It's quite interesting, you know. I don't really think saying, yeah, if we suddenly say we're critiquing liberalism instead of saying we're critiquing the left from within the left, you know, this this could this would just be sort of um you know, sophistry if it if it if it was what I was claiming. There's not that at all. It's just that these are the terms that are 
at stake and need to be kind of uh, thought through. So these are exactly the kind of debates I think we should have in the magazine. Um, but the second answer to that is just what, what, what do I think of about that relationship, I suppose, when I throw around the term liberalism myself? I think I'm, I'm interested in the way in which, uh, like you said, Ashley, but uh, maybe the way in which capitalism is able to mystify itself, you know, so, you know, in what in what sort of philosophical, economic or cultural kind of ideas are are precisely deployed so that capitalism can mystify the situation that it's in, make its politics obscured and pre and prevent a left from sufficiently developing. So, you know, for me, thinking about critiquing liberalism is really thinking about how does capitalism uh, embed itself, mystify itself and allow itself to continue, I guess. Um, but but uh, but I think that's all those questions are, are, are good ones. I mean, yeah, we should get Lee in. <laughs> yeah. Um, listen, I'm I'm going to step away for just a second to because I look like I feel like with my ring light on, I look like something terrible is happening to me. I'm I've got um, a fever or I I'm come down with the plague or something. So I'm going to uh, turn my ring light off. I'll be right back. <laughs> I, I said to Doug when I first got on the line, I was like, oh my God, I look terrible. I look like my mom, but in a bad way. <laughs> <laughs> my mom's very pretty, but you know, she's in her sixties. Um, <laughs> but I, I, but I, there's like this critical moment when you're putting on makeup. So I put on makeup because I was going to do a TikTok because I taught my little dog Marks. <laughs> I taught him a trick. Yes, <laughs> I taught him a new trick, which is totally stupid and ridiculous. And I was going to, record it for tiktok did you see it i sent you the video I, saw it. I thought it was great but so the makeup's for the tiktok audience not for these guys because <laughs> there's what a critical when you're, far away from the, <laughs> when you're far away from the camera you need to see your features right but i like saw myself and there's like this critical moment in putting on makeup where it, it just looks you just look worse and worse and i saw myself i was like ah. <laughs> turns out I, I turns out no matter what i do i'm just i look like this um uh... <laughs> So I taught my dog surplus value and uh, wage labor. <laughs> and he's going to teach you all. He's going to teach you all on TikTok, surplus value and Let's wage put labor. The, put the link to our TikTok in the, in the chat there. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm uh, what is it? Sublation talk with Ashley Farley if you want to follow me on TikTok. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, I I don't want to like. I mean, I guess this is also the thing of coming on and 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 introducing myself as the editor. You know, I don't want to like impose my. Uh, I mean, I think I'm interested in the right things, um, but I think it's our writers and and the community we've got that makes us special uh, and gives us a range of a range of questions like this one about the left's use of the word liberalism, which I think is really. Um, worth thinking about uh, and so I think we've got I don't know we're going to have two or three of the people who have written for us oh, is that a beer it's quite <laughs> late it's quite late where I am yeah. <laughs> and a long day <laughs> so. deserved beer no we, we, we can we, we we I was really pleased with the stuff we put out today so I think we should it's um great yeah we should get these guys on and, and, and talk about their their brilliant article yeah, so okay, without so without further ado, first? Uh, I've got uh, Ted Reese, who people might know as Grossmanite on Twitter, or Ted Reese, if you read his excellent work elsewhere. Um, so, uh, Doug, do you want to bring Ted? There we go. Hi, how are you doing? Thank Hi, you so good, much for... You. Good. Okay. Thank you so much for coming on, especially with such uh, short notice. So we That's published a, a, uh, a piece uh, by you today. I have to say all the pieces that we published are exceptionally good, um, really accessible articles. Um, some of them made me laugh. Some of them gave me deep anxiety, particularly the one about plane crashes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Ted's your piece really got me um, thinking um, because I remember a long time ago, I read, I was just reading an article, I don't remember, you know, in a journal. And this author says, uh, of course, Marx's dialectical materialism is only meant for as a, a way of organizing thought. It's not meant to understand. It's not it's not something that happens in the real world. The world itself does not operate in this way. What would you say to that author? Yeah, so a lot of the time it's talked about as in terms of being a methodology, Um of sort of uh, simply about approaching things from the unity of opposites or how um, 
quantitative change leads to qualitative change. But Marx actually wrote a, um, a dissertation on what materialism meant for Epicurus and Lucretius, who were ancient philosophers who 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 didn't agree with the atomist view of matter. And yeah, I mean, Thomas Nail is the guy to to really talk to about this, but he he's written an excellent book which I which I cite in my piece, and um, he explains that Marx's position was that matter is a sort of what he what he calls a fluid kinetic process. Um, so, right at the crux of all of Marx's work is is this position which breaks from a sort of atomist or basic materialism. And um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's really fundamental. Um, and uh, as I say in the article, I think science, scientific thought today is really heading in this direction of really starting to work this out because of our sort of technical, our rising technical capacity with every innovation, uh, we can see things clearer. And um, I think it's really important to to talk about this because I, um, it's just really. I mean, firstly, I just find it absolutely fascinating that this sort of thing is coming coming through now, and we can actually see it. Um, but yeah, it's it's a bit it's a bit more than just talking about Marx uh, uh, talking about dial dialectical materialism as a, as a sort of methodology for seeing how things interact. <laughs> Yeah, because you make quite a big claim because it is a bit um, controversial whether or not mm. these kinds of ideas can be applied to nature, something outside of human society. And this is what you seem to be doing in the article. Um, do you uh, do you how do you kind of get over that pushback where people say, well, no, this is just something that is is social. It can't be because I remember I once wrote a, an article and I talked about um, like the word, like reality is dialectical. And I use the example of like a mountain <laughs> being produced out of opposing forces and the editor deleted it <laughs> a Marxist magazine. And I went, Oh no, I've crossed a boundary here. Do you think you've gone too far? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I've gone too far, <laughs> but, um, the, th the thing is like when you, um, read, this read Marx's dissertation and you read what Thomas Nell's writing about it and then you look at scientific thought today it just seems to be very clear to me that Marx's position is right on this and it's it's just a like quantum th field theory is the one I focused on most I think this is the most important one it's it's an advance on from quantum mechanics um and you know they don't really talk about particles and atoms anymore they talk about wave functions and fields of energy that are constantly vibrating and ultimately inseparable. Um, the view is that all of the universe is one whole. And the word Marx uses, um, I can't remember the German word now, I'm gonna to have to look it up, but it means um, it means hangs, hangs together. Um, that's, a, that's a word he, he uses quite extensively. And um, Thomas now uses the, it's, sorry, it's here. Um, no, I've lost I'm not it. sure we have sorry. any German speakers in the chat anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I've lost it, but, um, but it, yeah, the word means hangs together. So even a word like interconnected, Marx wouldn't use because that implies some sort of binariness of you know chain, chains sort of linked together separately but together on a chain whereas Marx will use this word uh, that means hangs together and um, yeah. and now uses the example of like the threads of a spider web I think like another good example would be like um, bubbles you know um, the, fil the film of, of bubbles sort of um, always sort of like hanging if you could like stretch them out sort of thing across the universe that would that would maybe be a good way of visualizing it um but yeah it's just you can't really separate anything ultimately what we see what things that seem to be discrete are they're only relatively discrete so in in quantum field field theory they describe 
relatively discrete things as excitations, um, i.e. sort of spikes in energy within these quantum fields. So I think ultimately, if you if you separate, if you do analysis that separates things out, if you separate nature from a socio-economic organization, you're falling into sort of old bourgeois mechanistic binary thought, whereas that's never been true, although it has reflected the technical capacity of the time, um, to be fair. Whereas we're we're sort of only discovering these things. We're only, we can only say we can only start to say Marx was right about this, and you know Epicurus was right about this now because we have the technical capacity. So yeah. a similar thing kind of happened with the social sciences. Um, you know, famously uh, Max Weber, um, and he wasn't the only one, but there was this attempt to sort of delineate these spheres where economy was separate a separate sphere from society and this led to not i'm not i don't want to make a causal claim that weber was responsible for this but there was this this sense that all there were all these discrete spheres and therefore you had uh, the social sciences each with its own discrete areas of interest so you have a, an economist who doesn't talk to a sociologist who doesn't talk to an anthropologist um and but this was partially this was this grew out of the apologetics of of capitalism. So, you know, these things ne'er the twain shall meet economics and society. No, no, no. We're going to talk about these things entirely separately. But in terms of of nature, are you saying that this there's no sort of or the natural sciences, there's no political backing to this? Is it because there there's no vulgar natural science because it appears so depoliticized? They can just make these claims without even realizing that they are overlapping with dialectical materialism. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's conscious at the moment. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of it is in, they've started sort of interpreting it as as a sort of monistic or uh, or, or like monism in, in a sort of, in that sort of way, which sort of lends it uh, often lends itself to a sort of Spinozian um, analysis where you know everything is one, but you know everything is God sort of thing. And so you do see um, sometimes this sort of thing being taken up by right lib scientists who are right libertarians. Um, but but if you if you look into the more detailed quantum physics, they do challenge the idea that it can be that it can lend itself to a god quite thoroughly, actually. Um, there's a really good YouTube channel by a guy called Arvin Ash. He sort of breaks all this stuff down. And um, although he stops short of saying he can't disprove God exists, um, he he um, does a very thorough job of actually doing so. And um, yeah, it's a lot of it is it's, you know, that scientists are doing this work without re they, they don't realize that what they're doing is, is essentially Marxism. Um, they're not quite there yet, but when you put it all together, you know, um, they are doing holistic analysis rather than a binary one, which would have been the case in the past. So atomistic thought it is going out the window and it's just, yeah, the, the word that comes to mind is, is holistic for the, the way that they're approaching things. And it's starting to you're starting to see things like biology and physics become an interdisciplinary subject and that sort of thing. They're, these sort of mergings are happening and which is another as aspect of this whole development. Which is funny because there's always a joke with undergrad students when you study biology, you're actually studying chemistry and you study chemistry, you're actually studying physics. And it seems like it's just a sort of con a conscious way of doing that. But I think Alfie wanted to ask a question, yeah. but I just wanted to comment. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Um, that um, I think there, when I was talking about sort of vulgar science, there's definitely like vulgar natural science, that kind of science that's like, oh, why are we this way? Why do we have this problem? Well, because on the savanna gla grasslands, you know, 10, 50,000 years ago, the people needed to blah, blah, blah. <laughs> 
See, <laughs> why are we better than dogs? Because we can sit still during a conversation. Um, but the the natural sciences were kind of permitted, uh, most of the natural sciences and physics and so on were kind of permitted to make these kinds of leaps and bounds because they're so, they appear at least to be so far removed from society. Um, they don't need to play that justificatory function. Um, and if anybody doesn't know what I'm talking about with vulgar economics, this is what Marx talks about, that he um, separates economics into discrete periods. You have um, when economists could afford to be proper scientists and just look at the world and say, well, what's going on here? And he put, for the most part, Ricardo and uh, Adam Smith in that. And then after the class struggle became open and the contradictions of capitalism became more obvious, it was no longer possible to do disinterested economics. People like John Stuart Mill um, were part of the vulgar economists who were doing economics to not to simply explain the world, but to justify it. And so I've always thought there's a division between a kind of vulgar science and a science proper. And vulgar science is a science that's done to justify the way things are. And science proper is so, seem, is so strange and seems so far removed from society that people couldn't afford to think and think through things. Sorry, Alfie, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm just listening. I think it's great. I mean, I really found your article fascinating, Ted, and I was really interested in the individualism bit. Um, you know, I won't ask you to talk too much about it because people can, can read it. But I guess what I wanted to ask is really generally... Um, like, do you think this is a good, hopeful move? Because part of the tone is that, is that it is. But and, and the, the sort of positive, you know, the optimist in me wants to say, well, you know, this is good because, as you say, you know, finally people are, are seeing on a certain level in certain places that a Marxist way of thinking is better. And in the article, you, you suggest that, you know, this could pivot away from science being a sort of um, backup for a capitalist kind of individualism and, and turn it into something which could be more useful from a Marxist way of thinking. But then from a, the cynical perspective in me wants to say well is this the place where marxism is allowed to happen uh, or something instead of where we need it or something like what does it mean that it's it's the scientists behind paywall journals in the academic sphere that are now free to think in this way uh, so and i wonder whether you think overall you know do you see a, a route here that's going to take us in the right direction or do you think there's also an aspect to this which is you know this part of the problem is that this is where this is appearing yeah, I think you're right to say that on both both fronts, really. Um, I mean, so, sort of one way I look think about why they're allowing this sort of uh, thinking to be going on is, you know, it, it kind of justified su justifies something like the Internet of Things, where you know the they need to they constantly need to um, try to integrate and diversify production. So integrate the, the means of production globally and diversify the number and type of commodities that are being produced. And so something like the Internet of Things, which is pretty controversial um, in lots of different ways, um, you, you know, this kind of scientific thought backs it up. And this is why I try to sort of talk about the evolutionary side of capitalism moving towards socialism a lot because um yeah while capitalism still exists the the ideology and philosophy of of capitalism is adapting to the, the the changing needs of capital accumulation but what and what i've argued in the in my past articles is that the you know the more productive capitalism becomes the the more impossible private property or private ownership of production becomes, um, you know, the, the more the mass of humanity has been excluded from that, from that ownership of property. And so it, it's quite hard to articulate, but yeah, the scientific thought will be used in ways that benefit capitalism while, ben while capitalism can still continue mm. to keep going. Um, but at the same time, I see it as a as a sort of a pivoting point as well, where um, it just becomes clearer that this is the direction we're heading in. And, I th you know, th some, talking about stuff like this is, is probably quite important. Um, it's probably more interesting than economics. <laughs> and... <laughs> 
And um, yeah, I, I think you're right to have a have a, a cynical view of it as well as a as a sort of positive, optimistic one. But um, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. both are true. I agree. I think, like some of the comments, I agree also that this question of the relationship between the death of the individual and capitalism is really important. But and I think you're right to raise all these questions. I, I found it a really thought provoking piece. And and yeah, like you say, people should also look at the other essays that you published some with us because there's a history there of how you see capitalism going and uh yes yeah, great to have your pieces uh sort of raising these questions i think so thank you <clears throat> so do we want to bring in um stefan or helen who are patiently waiting in the wings we'll bring in yeah. both of them okay we, let's do yeah let's do planes and then do serious uh bourgeoisie stuff with stefan <laughs> okay Okay. Hi, Helen. Hello. How's it going? Good. How are you doing? Fine. I'm surrounded by boxes. Yeah, so you but are. But this is like the only place to do any kind of live streaming. So apologies for the. It's even worse over there. You can't see it. It's great. No, uh, let's talk. We'll talk a bit about your article, but also I just want to say, Helen. Um, you know, Helen's a a, a, a Lacanian psychoanalytic filmmaker. Also. Um, writer essayist and she's uh, she does a podcast as well with uh, benjamin studebaker who we published not so long ago as well and with nina power which is called the lack i uh, really recommend that and helen's also uh, joining uh, stefan uh, and jason as a contributing editor i think we're calling it which means you know sometimes publishing stuff with us or sending us things that you suggest that you, we might publish as well so i'm interested to talk to you about like, just generally like the kinds of stuff that you would like to write and, and see written as well um, but um, first of all, let's talk about the planes. Ashley, okay. you said it, it made you feel quite anxious. So, I mean, <laughs> I've got to confess, I've got to like say, I also watch these um, uh, plane crash videos that basically are designed to kind of get you to sleep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're not designed to get you to sleep, but the effect is they're quite weirdly comforting and send you to sleep. Do you not that, think that that is what the not the average listener viewer of like the, the the stuff we're talking about is things like flight channel and disaster breakdown, which has millions of subscribers. I mean, my instinct is to say everyone uses it the same way we do. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting because it is sort of like it plays out in a sort of very ASMR -y way. So whether it's designed for it or not, the fact that it's they've, they've chosen the kind of music and the way it's edited and put together, it does have that kind of lulling effect just on a material level not only on you know the the, the content itself <laughs> but um ashley what made you sort of feel anxious about it what was your comment going to be on that okay so when i was a kid i used to be able to watch like slasher movies and and we would rent them on purpose and we would laugh we just had like me and my girlfriends we have so much fun watching like horror flicks and we thought they were great. And I could go to amusement parks and ride the rides and be really fun, lighthearted. And then I fell into so many internet rabbit holes where I would do this to myself, but I would, I read once an entire article on Wikipedia about theme park accidents. <laughs> and then on the night before I was going to a theme park <laughs> and I was when I was screaming on the rides I was really screaming because the fear was real to me um <laughs> and so and now I can't and like I read about murders and so on because I guess like a lot of people have got a perverse curiosity and so you know you start reading this story uh-oh you're <laughs> cutting out actually oh no um uh, anyway, so now I can't watch these movies because the fear that I'm feeling is real. It's not fun anymore. And I can't watch these. Like, I was reading your art. I fly a lot, right? And I was reading your article and I felt sick. Even just reading the short descriptions of mm. the flights and things that went wrong. And, and I was like, oh, and I felt absolutely <laughs> I'm similar to you, you know, in that, like, for, there's a there's a there's um you know the the theme park universal studios and they have this like these horror houses with like actors in it and the last time i went i went you know one day and walking through it like i, I was actually crying by the end of it it was like a panic attack that was totally real and i don't know if it's as i got older i used to you know not have a, a care in the world in terms of flying but now i just can only picture you know the ten thousand meters under my feet but, you know, and it's always every every time I board and fly quite regularly, 
you know, it's like if, if I get if I land at the end of this, I'll be grateful my, for my existence every second of my life going. For, and I forget about it, you know, within five minutes. Um, you know, and sort of, we all know that we're all going to crash and it's okay, but, you know, we've just repressed <laughs> that. <laughs> no, I mean, no, I, 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 to do with the fact that, because um, obviously in the piece I tie it to sort of the anxiety produced by capitalism, whether over the last sort of decade or so, material conditions have got so much worse that anxiety in general, or the anxiety that I feel that's maybe representative of the anxiety that other people feel is, you know, is heightened, or if it's, you know, getting older or being a woman or I don't know. <laughs> No, I mean, it's tempting. I mean, you're about to do it anyway, but uh, it's tempting. I just want to talk about like my own plane crash experiences and think the way it works for me. I mean, I actually, this is extremely strange. When I get a plane, I actually like to close my eyes when I'm on the plane and imagining it crashing and going through the video thing. It's extremely strange. But anyway, people are going to obviously think, why are we pivoting from talking about marks, marks and science to crashing planes? But like you said, you do actually, what you're doing in this article is using this like, bizarre little popular phenomenon of plane crash videos to say something about capitalism and uh, and a, make a critique of that. And you're also uh, using a psychoanalytic way of thinking to, to do so, which is kind of basically what all your work is broadly about, right? It's using psychoanalysis to demystify and and question our capitalist moment in different ways. So, you know, just, just in the context of plane crashes or in general, just give us your sort of position on, on this stuff. Yeah, if I can remember what I was saying, it, basically the idea is that I think it's interesting that, um, so plane crash, this sort of plane crash phenomenon, um, often people are told if they are scared of plane crashes, that the best way to overcome their anxiety is to research plane crashes. And the idea is that you're supposed to discover that it's so unlikely that the plane crashes, that you come to be less anxious about uh, you know, getting on a plane. So for instance, when something goes wrong, it's not like, oh, one thing happened. It was a series of, you know, 10 or so things that happened, you know, were, were um, the opposite of a miracle. So, so many things had to go wrong accidentally. And now, you know, when you're told, when you research these plane crashes, what they did to uh, mitigate against plane crashes in the future, you know, they have sort of five or six fail safes to prevent the same problem happening again. For every plane crash that's happened, because of the system, it guarantees that that problem well, it doesn't guarantee, but the likelihood is that that problem is not going to arise again. But it's interesting because like the plane industry operates. I mean, it's obviously it's within capitalism. Every, everything's within capitalism, but it operates in a way that's like maybe slightly different. And just as the plane crash is supposed to be the um, exception that proves the rule for the safety of the aviation industry within capitalism, perhaps this idea of the smooth running of the aviation industry is... Um, well, it's the exception that proves the rule that capitalism doesn't work, but we're supposed to read it as a sort of way that uh, that shows that capitalism actually functions rationally and reasonably. So, you know, I talked a little bit about Concorde not taking off and the fact that we um, use uh, planes that aren't that much more developed from, say, the 1960s, for instance. Um, so it was much less safe in the 1960s, but because uh, collectively we've gone for uh, safety and uh, rather than, um, uh, let's say, innovation, you know, we could, Concorde would take people across the Atlantic at twice the speed of, you know, a regular plane. Um, th this is sort of like hides the lie that actually capitalism, the rest of capitalism doesn't really work like this. And profit is often generated precisely because of danger and precisely because of sacrifice and pre precisely because of ruination. And things like, you know, um, I think I mentioned the budget airline industry. So it's interesting that in the past, uh, the airline industry was very glamorous, it was for very wealthy people, but perhaps the glamour was a way to mystify for the anxious flyers at the time that this was something, you know, very enjoyable and, you know, um, it, the, the sexiness of the short skirt of the, the air hostess maybe sort of distracted, you know, the reality of flying through the air in a tin can. But um, nowadays, there's many more ways that uh, airlines make money out of passengers because they're not really making money out of passengers because perhaps because of this focus on safety, they've sacrificed the kind of uh, profit uh, sort of impetus on the selling of seats. So things like being sold a scratch card as a way to get profit out of um, passengers and uh, airlines make much more money on sort of credit card schemes and that kind of thing than actually on uh, passengers, you know, people yeah. flying on the planes. I mean, I do. that's also 
a, a big topic and a really interesting thing. It's, it's so true. I mean, you, when you are on those planes, you see, you can see a kind of mini history of recent capitalism in that change from, you know, Don Draper getting a cocktail on the Pan Am or whatever through mm -hmm. to like, and, and basically you get on now and it's the same aircraft that he yeah. was on, you know? <laughs> uh, so it sort of shows how capitalism is, is like uh, frozen in its, but yet the aviation industry kind of, yeah, provides some kind of weird illusion that, um, yeah, okay, so great. I mean, I, I think that's I think that's good. And I put the article there so people can can look at it. Um, but just say a bit more then, Helen, before before we run out of time, like what mm -hmm. in general you think like psychoanalysis can do that's useful? Because one of the things I'm always saying I want to do with this magazine is like one of the sort of strands would be to have a strong kind of um, a series of psychoanalytic articles. Obviously, we've We've done a lot. We've we've done some great ones actually from Todd McGowan, Zizek, Julie Resch, uh, Dwayne Roussel, Agon Hamza, yourself. Um, but like, so you know, I, I guess I, I I also think that psychoanalysis can be critical in um, you know critiquing capitalism today. But but say what it is for you that makes that uh, important and why that's like the, the, the sort of main strand of your work as well. Yes, there's maybe like loads of different ways to sort of approach this, and it's interesting that psychoanalysis emerged. Um, at the at the at the rise of sort of um, you know industrialization in in uh, you know nineteenth century capitalism, so it does go along with um, identifying sort of some of the symptoms that emerge as a result of uh, capitalist mode of production. But you know, obviously today we're in a like a situation that we really really need political change. Like absolutely, we're getting to the point where it's just becoming absolutely bloody ridiculous. But the question is, why why have we not managed to achieve this? How have we managed to go along? with um, the kinds of systems that are really not in our best interest. And this maybe says something um, about the fact that capitalism operates not only just on a material level, but on a libidinal level, on a psychic level, and it has to do with the way that our subjectivity is structured and that there is a draw there um, because of um, the nature of subjectivity, the sort of denatured nature of human subjectivity, the irrational part of it. And in a way, um, capitalism is you know, um, an aspect of it that operates uh, on a sort of religious level, that it um, offers a promise of transcendence and wholeness by the commodity or by success or whatever, um, promising this sort of um, assuaging of a lack with which we are marked existentially in order to become speaking subjects. Um, but this is a promise that never comes and this uh, perpetual sort of uh, delaying of the promise that can never come sort of lets the, lets the system sort of go on. And psychoanalysis, we could argue, is maybe a sort of um, theology in response to this um, libidinal draw of capitalism, and that potentially it can help us make political change if we can actually understand libidinally and psychologically what we're actually dealing with in terms of the um, psychic sort of libidinal nexus of capitalism itself. It's not just a system of exchange. It's doing something. It's connected to the way that human subjects are at a distance in a way from reality. Um, and psychoanalysis is sort of a tool that can help us um, read reality for what it is so that we can come to yeah. terms with reality and make changes that are more beneficial to us. Can I yeah. ask a, one, one question oh. off to the side a little bit? I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm, um, if I was a patient in psychoanalysis, this, what I'm about to do would be considered <laughs> resistance, I think. Um, uh, but uh, uh, you at the beginning said that Watching plane crashes is, helps you go to sleep. Mm -hmm. It relaxes you. And I just wonder, what does it mean, either for me as uh, an individual or for capitalism overall, or the society overall, that um, there are many uh, recordings of Carl Pilkington that are, that are like 12 hours long, so you can listen to him talk <laughs> all night long. And I do that. I will put Carl Pilkington on talking to Ricky Gervais and because of the utter stupidity and inanity of their conversations, I find I relax and I, I fall off to sleep. So what does that mean? Helen? You know, it's interesting. It says that I have to listen to something to fall asleep, whether it's a podcast or, you know, watching Mad Men for the a millionth time. But I think it's something to do with the fact that, you know, with anxiety, right, that we have this sort of rumination um, and that these sort of, lulling devices help us fall asleep in a way that, you know, it maybe says something about the fact that we're all sort of het up and anxious in our lives and we can't relax because we're really, you know, we're not really, there's something that's not right with our material conditions, with the societies in which we live. And we haven't really got um, the capacity to change them or the capacity to even read 
fully what's going on. And I think that the more anxious we are, the more we, we need these little devices to help us fall asleep. So I don't know, maybe it says something about material conditions. Maybe not. Well, yeah, certainly I'm, in a, I'm more anxious um, than I, I would say that lately describing me as anxious is probably uh, accurate. Um, but uh, the, the fact that, um, uh, that Carl Pilkington is the plane crash of thought occurred to me. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yes. uh, no, I, I, I think it's interesting. You like Carl Pilkinson, Doug. <laughs> we'll leave that. Um, no, I, I, we, we got to. I, mean, I just want to quickly say before we get get Stefan on that. You know, I think that answer you gave us is actually really important. And we, before you came on, Helen, we were talking about um, terms like liberal and mm -hmm. uh, what does the word liberal mean when the left throws it round, and what does fascist mean, and so on, and how we can maybe try and, and sort of demystify some of the ways in which these things get thrown around and i think you know what you just said about psychoanalysis is you know uh is quite right you know what it can potentially do is see if we look at sort of some of our favorite uh rightists leftists liberals on twitter and the way they all interact with each other in this kind of you know precarious atmosphere of resentment and frustration and anger we do need and can use psychoanalysis to demystify what's actually being said and think about what's actually happening here. And, and it's generally mm -hmm. speaking, got an economic basis or a material basis, as you're saying. So I, I think that's a really yeah. good, um, you know, a good, a good thing to, um, uh, to, to say that psychoanalysis can help us with. Anyway, um, yeah, we're, we're running out of time already. So we're going to let you go, Helen, but thanks for coming on and the great article and people can read more of your stuff in Sublation Magazine uh, in the coming months and so on. Cheers. See you soon. Bye. 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 All right. All right. <laughs> Here he is. I hope my hey. sound. I hope my sound's okay. It's great, great. So the only of our authors whose article isn't yet out. Um, so we will talk about what people can read in the next few days in uh, Civilization Magazine with you. Um, so I mean, uh, what's what's happened to Ashley? By the way, is she here or not? Ashley's no, internet has. Um been acting up uh and when she, so i saw that she got disconnected there was a message that said device disconnected which just means that her wi-fi has failed but her. she isn't like in the background or whatever she's just gone she is she's gone, gone. She's got so she may get back on well i hopefully she will get back on by the time we run the patreon stream yeah. um which by the way is uh already waiting for us um and so if you go to patreon.com backslash diet soap um you can sign up to listen to more of this conversation uh you know around we'll start that around 10 20 um but yeah i at the moment oh there wait look here she is ashley's okay. back see she will be here for the <laughs> patreon i tried stream. to be a perfectionist i can you hear me tell me yeah. you can hear me <laughs> Yeah, okay. I tried to be a perfectionist because my mic cut out a little bit and I was like, well, I'll just go and fix the issue. And then everything crashed and I couldn't get back into the room, mm. which is a shame because I had a question about anxiety because I actually think that there's no direct relationship between capitalism and us being anxious. I think that an anxiety, anxious outlook is actually invited of the ideal subject in neoliberalism. Oh, well. Oh, so you think it's a particular... Really it's particular way of, of managing capitalism and it's and the crisis of capitalism that started maybe in the 70s that leads to condition people leads the system or society into conditioning people as anxious subjects so does that what you're well i don't know i you i don't know about the 1970s thesis um i'm talking more about the um, forms of governance, I suppose, that have been around for a long time um, that you might call neoliberal, in this, but that might be a bit confusing because then you start thinking about Thatcherism and the 80s and that sort of thing, which is part of it. Um, but I like to think of it as a kind of post-liberal, post-liberal forms of governance, that it's not a continuation of the liberal project that begins, you know, with the Enlightenment or whatever it might be, but um, is its end, um, the end of the belief in the ideal sort of free willing subject. So subjects must learn to understand themselves as being risky um, because as I've explained many times over and over and over again, that how neoliberalism understands problems is because of subjects, because of things that citizens do, that people do, um, mistakes that they make. And so whenever there's a problem, they're always looking for the behavior that causes it. Um, 
And so in that context, you can't really have freedom because it's your freedom that screws everything up. You have to, you know, there has to be, a, it's, it's a misunderstanding to think that neoliberalism, which is why I call it post-liberalism, is just when the state does nothing. Paradoxically, in order for the state to do nothing in terms of this fra externally fragile market, your everything that goes on around it must be tightly controlled. The behavior of people around this perfectly functioning yet externally fragile market must be controlled. Um, and so within that, um, subjects have to learn to think about themselves in different ways um, as uh, doubting their free will, doubting their ability to act without careful guidance of experts and um, technocrats and rules and guidebooks for the correct conduct of life. Um, and I think anxiety or, or being aware of risk is part of that. As a good citizen, you should be aware of any and all risk. You, you know, you, you like your breast aware, right? You should examine your breasts all the time. You should, as a young man, you should think about your testicles constantly. <laughs> like, um, you should be aware. And, and that is part of you, you as a good person means you are aware of all sorts of risks, no matter how small. And you work to make other people aware of risks. And as a parent, as a good parent, you should be aware of and protect your children from any and all risk. The bad parent is the one who does anything risky, even the risks of avoiding all risks. <laughs> um, and so this is part of, I suppose you could call it post-liberal governance. So I don't think it's, I think part of that is I think there's a lot going on in terms of anxiety, but I think part of the rise in anxiety um, is the fact that it is actually invited as the correct disposition of the good citizen. There was a lot to, in the first two uh, conversations, I found myself agreeing and disagreeing in different ways with both uh, authors. And um, I think I want to, uh, I'm, I'm going to want to really read Ted Reese's uh, article closely again and maybe even respond to it because I I find myself siding with a different interpretation of what the dialectic is than he does and um, but these are the kinds of debates that we need to be having I think yeah. uh, if we're going to create a, a, a left subject that can actually uh, act we have to resolve some of these conflicts between us and then before we can overcome yeah. contradictions yeah yeah, absolutely. Well, like, when, I was, <laughs> when I was editing Ted's article, there was a lot that I thought, oh, this is really interesting. And I'm glad that someone's kind of put this together. And some things that I was thinking, like, I don't know, is this sort of the epigenetic stuff I've never really found super interesting. And in fact, I think it's it it's a lot of it is not. Yeah, a lot of it, not all of it is riven with capitalist apologetics. But anyway, that's a whole other kind of debate. And I, I th I'm glad that we publish these things because I don't always agree, but I, I'm glad that people are, are making these arguments and pushing them forward. And then maybe we can think about whether or not we think how we think, how good they are at understanding the world as it is and how to move beyond that. You know, when Spencer started Sublation, he wanted, he insisted upon the idea that we would be a place for anyone on the left to put forward an argument and 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 make a case. And we were not going to be sectarian and we were not going to be censorious. And um, that is certainly, I know, Alfie, something you want to continue. Uh, yeah. As you, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, exactly. I mean, disagreeing with these things is part of what we're trying to do. Right. And this is also mm -hmm. part. At this community of people doing doing that, but I think before we run out of time, we we do want to hear about Stefan's article, which is gonna which is really great and which is gonna be out next on mm -hmm. the magazine. Um, and Stefan's also uh, gonna it, it well has been anyway a, a contributing editor. So I think this will be your sort of sixth column or something, uh, Stefan. So there's a whole kind of archive there as well that's worth looking at. But in this one, you're you're talking about um, the question of Marx and the bourgeoisie, but also about AI. And how, right. um, you know, this debate, I suppose, about the AI uh, taking over the jobs of the bourgeois rather than the worker and so on, and what this means for the future of the relationship between capitalism and the bourgeoisie. So can you give us a little snippet of it uh, that people can, can look forward to reading about? I mean, the, the origin of the article is I, to orientate around. I'm normally quite like a, a bourgeois believer, like in my forthcoming book, forthcoming at some point. Um... <laughs> Uh, how to be a teenage nihilist, I argue in the, the chapter about climate change that I do think the bourgeoisie and generally elite groups will be able to overcome climate change. 
And the left shouldn't argue that only climate change can, only socialism can resolve climate change because at some point in the future, we're going to be embarrassed when that doesn't happen. Um, but over this winter, I was really disappointed in the bourgeoisie because, well, when we, they, you know, they had plenty of warning. We knew that the Russians were going to cut us off from energy. And what happened? Did they like, you know, we're going to build loads of things to produce more and more energy. It's going to be infinite. And, you know, it's going to be dangerous. There's going to be coal. We're going to pump coal. We're going to do nuclear power. It's going to be scary, but we're going to, we're going to give, we're going to tear up society. We're going to tear up the ground. We're going to destroy, but create a new, you know, um, not really. They didn't really do anything. Um, instead, we were encouraged to like tighten our belts. Um, <laughs> and we, we bought up, we bought up loads of um, gas from the third world, which obviously doomed people in Sri Lanka and in, in Pakistan. Pakistan and Sri Lanka have put out charters for, for gas production in the next years and just no companies took them off on their offers. And ironically, they've been kept up in gas via the Russians selling it to them on cheap. But the bourgeoisie and, and, and capital in Europe didn't seem to react to a grand energy crisis by being like, oh, we're going to build. We're going to put all of this power into, to, into the field and, you know, who cares about the dangers? Instead, they were like, no, no, we have to be careful and slow. We have to be concerned about the environment. And, you know, we're going to burn the gas, but it's going to be part of a sustainable plan or whatever. And I'm like, I don't feel like these people are really the ones that are going to continue to, you know, keep revolutionizing the, the means of production. It feels like kind of they've reached the end of their tether. Um, and then I go in to talk about kind of how like things which are which are being produced new, like new consumer items are like direct repetitions. Like there was this advert which infuriated a lot of people in the UK, which said something like, you know, your parent generation got a, a, the housing boom. It was very easy for them to buy the house, but you can get vegan bacon, which tastes like real bacon. And people were obviously frustrated with that because, you know, uh, bacon is worse than a house. But I would say actually that the problem with that is, is less that, and more the fact that that's nothing new. Vegan bacon, and explicitly in, in the advert, it's saying we're, we're nothing new. This is nothing original in any way. This is a product which we've intended to become is exactly as identical to a previous product, but in some ways it's produced in a different way, so it's safer. It's safer ethically. It's safer in kind of the, the way it's produced. It keeps for longer and so on but it's deliberately a repetition. And the same with electric cars, it's exactly the same. And so these new consumer items mm. don't seem to be progressive. They don't seem to change our everyday life, but they instead kind of create the, the, the same thing, but in a, in a different form. Um, and then the final part of the article is talking about- This was new, you know, a long time ago. These were new when they came out. Yeah, yeah, and, and mobile phones were amazing. And mo mobile, well, I mean, I really, smart, really smart phones, smartphones, oh, smart not phone, just yeah. mobile, mobile phones. phones too. Smartphones, like smartphones, are amazing, right? Mm -hmm. Once we, it co completely changed how you orientated yourself in a city, right? Before mm -hmm. it would be, you could be before Google Maps and so on. You could be in a city and you could be fucked. Or you could be going wandering around London trying to like find one of these maps, which is every mile, or like asking strangers and so on, who obviously they themselves often don't know what they're doing because London is full of people who don't live in London. Um, and every area of London is filled with people who are from different areas of London. Mm. Um, but something like that completely transformed how we kind of operate in the city, Google, Google Maps, which is obviously might not be always for the best, but it was a revolution of kind of everyday life. Vegan bacon and, and electric cars are literally just a repetition. Um, and for you, this is like a kind of sign of this out of ideasness that characterizes not just a bourgeois class, but also the left and, and where we're at, right? Yeah, like it's an, an exhaustion. Uh, it seems to me that, you know, we're reaching a point where, you know, kind of the, the, the things that, you know, you can't have, there's no new kitchen items in terms of like a refrigerator or a microwave and so on. And that might just be because there isn't another thing to offer really within our mode of production. Another thing with wouldn't require massive technical productive and scientific revolutions to get a, like you know some kind of thing where you press a button it just produces the food or whatever magical sci-fi thing we're going to think of but it doesn't seem there's any revolution that's just on the horizon mm. but and then the final part of the article is talking about the one thing which does seem revolutionary 
which is AI. Mm -hmm. um, recently, the, the the revolution kind of in the first half of last year was about um, artificial intelligence being able to produce images, uh, pictures, or art. Uh, though people get very frustrated about it being called art. Um, and that's great. <laughs> I now have a little program on my desktop, which I can type whatever stuff into, and it produces an image. Um, like for if you're writing a novel or whatever, you can put this stuff in and it produces like an image of the character you're imagining. And this is really great. It's useful. Um, and it's just kind of an amazing resource. Um, and obviously, it's it's very, very flawed at the moment. And you need to be con like, it's something which requires technical skill still to produce these images, which are anything which aren't terrible. You need like, uh, you need to know kind of the sorcery of doing them, the exact kind of words to put in to make everything work. Um, but obviously stuff like this will be overcome. Uh, they will become much better. You won't need to become a sorcerer to get them to work. Um, and there's no real reason to think otherwise, I don't think. Um, and the other thing, the revolution in the last few months has been the open AI chatbot, which has come out and it's just so much better than all the previous ones. And it can produce, you know, it was, it basically has crawled um, the open source internet, stripped everything out and produced things as if they were from the open source internet. So it can produce the kind of comment that you would get if you asked on like a technical forum on Reddit or whatever. Um, and these are all great resources, which, which help people. But obviously as with, any real capitalist innovation, they then threaten people. They threaten sections of the working class um, with with removal, with extinction, because any useful function um, is currently being filled by working people. If they're then replaced by automation, these people are thrown out of work. But what I wanted to highlight with AI is that the bourgeois functions, which kind of rely on kind of like a certain general intelligence and ability to have like a human character um, an ability to interact with with people, these can be taken over by AI in a way that previous innovations like the steam pump made no threat to the general ro role of the bourgeoisie. You know, I, I, I we should continue this part of the conversation. We'll talk about Chat GPT. Is that what it's called? In in the parrot room. But I, before we go, I I have to throw a comment up on the screen just to bother <laughs> Ashley, really. <laughs> Someone asked, is Stefan Ashley's son? And um, I read that and I immediately felt one fucking foot enter the grave. Yeah, you were past to them. I'm dead. <laughs> now, I, I do believe that I want to uh, just commiserate with I'm you. I'm only like Stephen. nine years older than Stefan. <laughs> right. So, uh, Derek Varn is 10 years my junior. And he, people have asked me if he is my son <laughs> again and again. So now you know what it's like, okay? Uh, welcome to the club. Um, it's because people are like generic old. When you get to a certain point, they're like just old parent age-ish. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm now at the point where I want to hold on to that generic parent age thing and not just be old old man you know like you know, here's your cane here's your walker <laughs> all right so, granddad um, <laughs> oh my god yeah soon enough i will be i've got you know my you actually are the age that my kids are so yeah yeah right so um all right now i'm depressed thanks a lot no, I, you, that got you, turned you, around on you, me you won't, you won't become a, a grandfather because you know the human race is going extinct and everyone's not having children so oh. look on the bright side of life okay zoomer <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> uh all right so let's let's uh round it off here and uh, alfie and stefan ashley you can make it to the second half of this right yeah and i have a couple of things that i want to say about chat gpt as well um okay. and that marks agrees with you stefan i think so right. i will say that right. momentarily <laughs> okay soon, uh... all right in the case of nuclear or radiological fallout